Okay, good evening and welcome to Kona Science Cafe. Um, this evening we have two researchers from the University of Hawaii who've been part of a multidisciplinary and multi-year research project to study freshwater flows in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and this two-part presentation will be about hidden groundwater pathways on our island, uh, which they've been studying for the past couple of years. Uh, Dr. Henrietta Dulai, she's a associate professor in the Department of Earth Sciences and a coastal geologist and geochemist, and has focused this part of the work on using chemical fingerprints to, uh, to trace the water flows. And she's going to go first, I think. Um, and um, Dr. Eric Atias is a research affiliate faculty member uh, with the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, and he uses electromagnetic sensing methods to image ocean structures, including freshwater plumes. Um, without further ado, uh, I guess uh, Dr. July. Aloha everyone, thanks so much for having us here this evening and spending your time with us. Hopefully you grabbed some coffee or tea made from the precious groundwater resources that we will be discussing today. And as, as you heard, this is a two-part talk, but still it's just a small section of the larger project that we are part of. And so today we will be talking about that underground subsurface invisible path of the water resources, so that's why we called it closing the loop in that we can now claim we have a little bit better understanding of the groundwater flow paths. And so I would like to acknowledge the Ikevai uh, project that we are part of. It's a National Science Foundation funded project. Uh, it's a UH system wide um, project and the PI is Dr. Gwen Jacobs. And the project's objectives are really our motto is securing Hawaii's water future. And it spans from anywhere uh, of, of doing basic research, as you will hear today, to visualization of data, better managing large data sources, making them more publicly available, while at the same time also answering questions about our water resources involving the community, uh, looking at the cultural perspectives of how to better manage the water resources. And then of course, educating the future water um, workforce um, who can really um, do a better job, uh, improve the job that, that we have been doing in managing our water resources. And I'm sure you will hear more uh, from more different groups from this project uh, in the future, because there is a lot of exciting research happening. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge a big mahalo to all our community partners and many of you are here and thank you so much for all the um, access that, that you provided to us and all the support. And so thank you again. So I start uh, with um, discussing first just roughly the water cycle but specifically focusing on to the coastal ocean. And we will be looking at coastal springs and Obviously, any source of water in coastal springs comes from precipitation. And uh, partially that precipitation then recharges into our aquifers. And here you see some images of the big island that shows uh, the precipitation on the left and then uh, where recharge is happening um, in larger fractions and, and it's special distribution on the right hand side. So these are all um, data sets that, that were already available that we took advantage of. And then specifically, we looked at how the water that recharges into the subsurface then travels towards the coastline where it eventually discharges. And you, I'm sure, experience some of these coastal springs, either swimming or wading in near shore waters. You can feel the coldness of these springs that discharge. Oftentimes, if you swim in a region that has larger springs, you can actually experience this clear, fresher or brackish water floating on top of seawater uh, because the fresh water has less salt, it's less dense, so it floats on the surface. And so the role of this water is not just that it's part of our water cycle and water resource, but it is also bringing in cool and nutrient-rich water into our coastal ecosystems. And these springs have been studied and even documented in, uh, 
in the indigenous um, uh, um, stories, Mo'olelo, and, and documented the newspaper articles that our project worked on. Um, but also, of course, there were scientific studies that looked at these. And so this image, for example, is showing a very nice visual um, taken from an airplane with a thermal infrared camera uh, by uh, my colleague Craig Glenn a couple of years ago with his student Adam Johnson. They identified all the cool springs that discharge along the shoreline. So those are the blue and green colors that discharge into the warm ocean, which is the red. And they identified over 70 springs on West Hawaii. And so what we did is that we visited uh, most of these and we obviously found their location, uh, quantified the discharge, how much water is um, each spring contributing to the coastal coastline, and then also sampled the water for its chemical fingerprints. And those chemical fingerprints are varied. They come from the land use, they come from also the precipitation as it fell on the land. The higher the elevation where the rain falls, um, the different signature of water, the H2O molecule, it will have. So specifically, the kind of oxygen that's locked into that water molecule can tell us, again, at what elevation um, or altitude that, that um, rain fell and then recharged into the water, in, uh, recharged into the aquifer. And so the springs that discharge along the shoreline are then a mixture of recharge that's happening all along this flow path. So then looking at what's, what's the composition of these coastal springs, we can try to then trace the water back to its origin, how far up in a watershed upstream we have to go so that we can reconstruct what's in the spring. And so that works very well, for example, for the springs indicated in red and green colors. So there we simply go and in absence of better understanding of those subsurface pathways in a straight line, there might be conduits that are not exactly straight, so I'm not claiming these are actual exact flow paths. But so again, uh, to the best of our um, guesses, it could be going straight upstream um, the red line indicates a straight path uh, from some of these coastal springs up to the Hualalai. And we can pretty much reconstruct the recharge along these lines that happen and contribute to the springs. The same is happening in the region that is colored in green. Here, some of the springs can be traced to pretty low elevation, low altitudes, some go up higher, but pretty much all these springs can be explained by recharge from this region. However, as you see, I have different lines and the dashed ones specifically are the ones that are not able to explain what we see in the springs. And what I mean by that, that the spring has a different signature. It simply needs water from a higher elevation, so the precipitation that fell at higher altitudes. And so those are represented by these arrows that just pretty much um, uh, point in a, from a direction that we don't know exactly uh, where the water is coming from, definitely from beyond the aquifer boundary from higher elevation, from the flanks of Mauna Loa, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea or the, or the saddle. So also you see there's different colors. Um, and so the different oxygen isotopic signature of this water uh, was analyzed and clustered. And this is a mathematical way of looking at similarities between different springs. And so the colors indicate groups of springs that are chemically very similar in terms of these oxygen isotopes. And so um, obviously they also then have these similar recharge pathways. Again, bottom line is many of the springs discharge water that travels from far beyond the aquifer boundaries. We also collected samples for age, measuring the age of the water, uh, which is done using its carbon isotope composition, so carbon-14 uh, dating of the inorganic carbon that's in the water that presumably came from the atmosphere when it fell as a rain and then infiltrated um, through the rock layers. 
And indeed, the ages confirm what, we, what the isotopes suggested, the oxygen isotopes suggested, that some of this water that discharges along the shoreline is many thousands of years old, had to travel and be held back in these different rock, rock formations um, before it discharged at the coastline. And then all those sh uh, shorter flow paths that are needed to explain the springs in the green region, those are much younger, only a couple hundreds of years old. Nevertheless, uh, we can say that whatever discharges along the shoreline comes not just from that immediate recharge along the shore, but from the high level aquifer or even from neighboring aquifers. And then of course, now that we understand kind of where the water is flowing, we can look at all, we can, we can look at all the land use that is above this groundwater and then see what's in the water. So what kind of signature it collected as it traveled in the subsurface. And uh, for example, we care about nitrogen, which is a nutrient um, that is very precious for those coastal ecosystems. But if you add too much of it, then, then we have problems uh, with uh, algae overgrowing the corals and so forth. So you'd like to understand where all the nitrogen in these coastal springs come from. And that ranges from natural sources like soil organic matter, but also from some anthropogenic activities like using fertilizers in agricultural fields. We have septic systems and cesspools that release organic matter and nitrogen into the groundwater or urban runoff. So all that would collect in the groundwater and be carried and discharged out at the shoreline. And so looking at, for example, nitrogen concentration in these springs, um, we can also look at the land use. So we have pasture and agricultural land. We have golf courses and resort landscaping. So those all would contribute nitrogen either naturally from organic matter decaying in the soil or using fertilizers. And then all these uh, points um, indicate individual on-site sewage disposal systems, many of those are cesspools that don't provide much treatment to uh, the waste that discharges into the aquifer. We also have a wastewater treatment plant um, that has um, a, a disposal pit for its effluent that, that we see the chemical signature of, of. And you see that the Kiholo aquifer has a relatively lower number of these cesspools and sources, anthropogenic sources, than the Keaho aquifer. And indeed, our nutrient concentrations, so nitrogen concentrations in the Kiholo aquifer are in general lower than in the Keaho aquifer. And we then use this, these nutrient concentrations and the groundwater discharge rates that we measured and calculated how much nitrogen each spring discharges. So that again, this informs coastal managers and others that, that care about these things um, um, on, on which are the regions where we have the largest nitrogen inputs. Because of course, coastal ecosystems in fish ponds, ankyline pools, and just along the shoreline do care about the nutrient content. In fact, what's fascinating about this story is that groundwater discharge is tidally what we call modulated in that when there is high tide, there is this wall that doesn't let the groundwater discharge, it's holding it back. As soon as the tide drops, that groundwater can gush out, coming out in a spring. And so we have high tide, uh, high salinities, and low groundwater discharge. When the tide is lower, we have more groundwater discharge, making the coastline salinities lower. But along with that lower salinity water also come nutrients. And so if we go from high tide, so those would be these samples diluted with the ocean water uh, and sample over time go over to low tide, you see that the nutrient concentration significantly increase. So this is one location, each color indicates one location and samples for nitrogen and phosphorus were taken um, over time. And you see that different locations have different ranges of these nutrients. So specifically here, I am plotting some numbers from Kiholo Bay and Honokohau Harbor. And why this is significant that if you are a, any part of the coastal ecosystem like an algae, um, during the tidal cycle, you experience ocean water level nutrients, which would be really low, like on the order of 0.3 micromolar, um, as the tide drops and more groundwater discharges and it gets less diluted with the um, ebbing tide, you get 10 
100 to 300 times higher nutrient exposure every tidal cycle. So it's fascinating how much nutrient tolerance and salinity tolerance these ecosystems have. And that's actually part of a, a, the same project, but a different um, a, a objective of a different project. Also, then based on these nutrient concentrations, you can uh, cluster these groups of, of springs showing that anything in the green group and the yellow group, where there are actually quite many cesspools, which you think are uh, a source of a lot of nitrogen, are um, along these nitrogen axes. So these are similar and impacted by nitrogen. The, orange and the blue, which are up here, are actually uh, negatively correlated with these nutrients. So there is, there is not much, not a very strong um, signature in those. And then interestingly, the, along the rift zone here, we have high silica content because of the magmatic uh, role of the, uh, the, the rift zone having the magmatic influence there. So this even makes sense in terms of land use. And so uh, oftentimes you may hear that uh, scientists are able to look at where the nitrogen is coming from based on, again, looking at the nitrogen isotope within that nitrate and the oxygen isotope within that nitrate. And this figure on the left here shows us, again, the same colored groups. Uh, what we have here is the nitrogen signature, uh, so the, um, um, the heavier nitrogen signature in the nitrate. Um, the higher the number, the more likely that there is some wastewater manure or, or well, these are the, the two culprits usually, um, are the source of that nitrogen. And then there are some overlapping regions between natural soils and, and fertilizers and atmospheric so precipitation um, nitrogen. So obviously these, these are definitely wastewater impacted. So those are collected in the Hono, in Honoko Harbor. Um, but some of these are, are overlapping. So the question is, since about upstream all of these green plots, we have quite many cesspools, is really wastewater contributing to these or are these all uh, nitrogen coming from soil? So we looked at another tracer and specifically I, I focus on also using um, human tracers like the medication that we take and our body excretes and it flushes down the toilet, it goes into a cesspool and then into the groundwater and eventually discharging by springs. So I looked at caffeine, I looked at antibiotics, here specifically listing fluoroquinolone as our group of antibiotics, and also carbamazepine, which is a anticonvulsant medication. And so we looked in those springs uh, that I colored green on the previous map that are downstream of uh, uh, quite many cesspools. Um, and indeed, we find concentrations of these pharmaceuticals in these springs, showing us that indeed, um, at least some of the nitrogen is contributed by wastewater, so leaky cesspools. Um, and so there is this chemical connection between the coastal springs and our land use, and so specifically here, wastewater. I would like to mention that Honoko Harbor receives um, the effluent uh, from uh, the wastewater uh, treatment plant that has a discharge pit just upstream of it. Again, it has definitely the nitrogen signatures. So these are two different locations within Honoko Harbor. And also we see these pharmaceuticals present in that water. And so the bottom line is that we have in the springs water that comes from many different parts of the island, not necessarily just within that watershed downstream of which they discharge. And also that their nutrient composition reflects at least some of the land use that we have shown so far. There is so much more to study. Uh, there is definitely a lot of natural nitrogen contributed, but these fractions still have to be determined. Uh, we see pharmaceuticals, heavy metals, and also the nature nitrogen stable isotope signatures that suggest that that wastewater signature is there, that something should be done about that. And lastly, what I would like to also talk about is a water budget. And so here we have uh, many numbers listed. So the white arrows here indicate the recharge as determined by some USGS studies. So I'm giving a range here. Uh, the, the higher numbers are the more recent updates. So these are all cubic meters per day of water recharged into the aquifer. 
uh, 30,000 and 60,000 cubic meters per day are pumped out of the aquifers. The rest is there to kind of seep out into the ocean. Yet the discharge that we capture along the shoreline is much less than what recharge, what's recharging. Obviously our near shore survey doesn't capture every single spring, so there are uncertainties on these numbers, but this still suggests that there must be some deeper flow path to the groundwater that discharges more offshore and it's not captured in these near shore things. And this leads me into Eric's talk, who will be talking about some great innovation that he did in that respect. So Eric, the floor is yours. Well said. Thank you, Anretta. For the introduction, I will share. Just let me know if you see the presentation properly. Yes. yes. Okay, so thank you very much all for uh, joining us. I'm very glad to show you my latest results and basically final results that are soon going to be published. Uh, and as Rieta showed you, the work that she has done and the other data sets show that there is a large discrepancy between the freshwater uh, uh, recharge and discharge. And that motivated us within the AKY to explore the possibility that the, some of these waters go into the submarine environment. And uh, what I'm going to show you is a marine electrical imaging uh, uh, geophysics study that I've conducting in 2018, offshore the west of Hawaii, with the aim to map those submarine freshwater that we thought might exist uh, in this region. So as you can, you saw in the previous uh, uh, presentation by Henrietta, the current kind, of, current kind of conceptual model used by ASG, USGS and very uh, vastly uh, illustrated in, in papers that discuss freshwater in Hawaii all show the same pattern, that you have fresh water coming into the coastline. And this is uh, the SGD kind of influx into the uh, water in the coastline. Beneath that, there is some brackish zone, as you can see on the left figure, which is a mixture of fresh and some salt water. But in the deeper layer, it's all uh, seawater. And this is basically the conceptual model, also the Board of Water Supply, uses the uh, way they calculate their uh, sustainable leads, uh, uh, yields and uh, storage of fresh water. But is that the entire story? They neglect the submarine environment where fresh water can go. So is actually SGD always stays in the coastline? And this is basically what we try to uh, explain with this study that I'm uh, uh, showing you today. So to answer that, we designed a marine geophysics survey uh, study that it's basically covers the entire offshore area in front of the Walalai region. It's about um, 50 kilometers of a coastline. And we had about uh, distances between 150 meters to four and a half kilometers from the coastline. We collected five data set which is the main one is control source electromagnetic, which we call CSCM. And I will show you what it means uh, in the next slide. But the thing is that we collected uh, a lot of data, about 220 kilometers of data in parallel lines uh, that kind of extend to the offshore in only eight days, which kind of substantial amount of data that we were able to acquire in this short amount uh, time of study. So, the main objective of this study was to do some sort of electrical imaging to the subsurface. And you can think about it as doing an MRI to the brain. You want to see different functionality or different areas with different structures in the brain. Similar, this is what we're aiming for when you're using this electromagnetic uh, uh, imaging technique, which is called CSEM. And basically what we do here, we uh, tow an array of a source, you can see at the beginning, just behind the boat, a 40 meter, two red lines. This red lines basically emits 100 amps of current and produces electromagnetic field. These fields 
going and they're propagating, diffusing into the subsurface. And then the secondary fields are recorded with the receivers, which we call them porpoise. That's why the system called porpoise. Those four uh, evenly distribute receiver, which are on the surface. Now, when the electromagnetic wave hits something with different resistivity than the background resistivity, we can capture these changes in terms of the amplitude and the phase of the secondary electromagnetic fields that are captured with those receivers. And then with some mathematical inversion that I will show you later, we can translate that to an image of the subsurface, what is resistive versus what is conductive. Um, now, the beauty of this system that is relatively inexpensive, we can deploy it uh, and use it daily, but it's limited to, uh, uh, to imaging of about 500 meters beneath the seafloor because we are limited in 100 meters of water. And also because it's on the surface, there is always the chance that a boat will run into uh, the array in the middle. That's why we put a lot of buoys, as you can see, the white and, and red buoys in between. And here you can see basically some uh, pictures of how light those receivers are. And uh, we can basically deploy them by hand and recover them by hand. And it took us about an hour to deploy and recover the entire array of one, uh, one, one kilometer about roughly uh, of, of the instruments. Besides that electromagnetic system, we also, as I mentioned before, we acquired magnetic data that can give us some sense of the intrusions, the magnetic intrusions from volcanic uh, uh, dice, and also seafloor um, information, how the topography of the seafloor using a multi-beam, and also a multi-beam of the water column, and a backscatter. And those all are kind of supporting information to the main information of the electrical information. It helps us to understand uh, the, everything in a one context, and it's also helping us to show the seafloor uh, topography in, for our inversion modeling. And when we put all of them together, this is kind of how it looked during the survey. It's a bit crowded, but it worked pretty well. When we have the porpoise array about a kilometer behind the vessel in the center, and then we have the magne magnetometer about 70 meter on the uh, port side, and the electromagnetic uh, source, what generates the electromagnetic wave, there is those two red lines on the side. Now I've been commonly asked, does this electromagnetic wave out there harmful for creatures? As uh, people are thinking uh, in terms of the seismic that does boom in the water and it's known to affect some uh, creature. But the beauty of this system that it's totally unharmful because we have a very short piece of copper, about 20 centimeter at the edge of the, of the antenna, that the fish really needs to come in contact with it fully in order to get some uh, effect of it, to get electrified, basically. But besides that, there is no effect at all, besides if it's only a strict uh, contact. So it's pretty safe for any marine uh, uh, creatures. This slide basically shows you some example of the high resolution of the multi-beam, the backscatter information that we acquired, as I mentioned before, we needed that to know exactly the seafloor topography in order to have our inversion modeling of the electrical data accurately described. But it also shows us there is a lot of coral terraces in this region. There is very sharp uh, slope of basalt and there is low uh, sediment content in that region. Uh, so the next thing, basically, what I'm going to show you is what we've done with this information, the electromagnetic information, and how do we generate an electromagnetic uh, imaging. We used uh, an inversion code that is called mari 2 dem Now, don't worry about the equation uh, below. Basically, what this code does is using some sort of mathematical iterative procedure that builds the model of the resistivity structure of the subsurface that is driven from the data that we, that we collected. It's not unique, but it still gives us a good description of what the resistivity changes within the subsurface are like. So after we inverted all the information in, along this entire region that you saw in the first, uh, the second slide, we got about 22 uh, independent models. Now, this is, there is a lot of information in the slides, 
but what I'm going to show you is the, the, the difference between those layers. So the uh, red colors, they represent uh, conductive structures that in this context, it's basically basalt, that it's saturated with seawater. Because seawater are conductive, this translates to uh, conductive values. As you can see in the value scale, this is a log scale. So the red are very conductive. The blue of uh, value of three, it's about 1000 ohm of resistance. So the blue shaded colors shows you areas where there is basalt with some sort of fresh water, brackish water to completely fresh water. So what you can see here that, first of all, there is a really nice match between all the lines uh, conducted. And we see that this kind of alternating feature that we have at the, uh, close to the sea floor, we have some conductive layer, which is basalt with, with seawater. And then about 130 meter beneath, we're starting to see this path, this line of fresh water. Then you have another conductive layer and then you have another fresh water layer. So that's really ties nicely. And you can see also there is two cross line, cross line one and cross line two that are very consistent with our inlines. So that shows us that this is, could be highly possible that that's the resistivity structure while those lines, independent lines confirm each other. That's one thing. Second thing we see that around uh, the area of Kailua Kona and to the south uh, part, we had four consecutive lines that started from about 30 meters of the water depth to about uh, 90 meters of water depth. They all show this large feature of uh, strongly resistive area, which we translate as a large scale freshwater reservoir in that side. Now, if you look back at the left side, you see line three north, it's pointing out at the left area. And to better see that layering pattern, this is a zoom in on line three north. And then you can see again, we have this conductive layer at the bottom, at the top, just before under the seafloor. And then we, it is separates a resistive layer with fresh water by low permeability layer of most probably ashen soil that accumulated between volcanic eruptions. So they act as confining unit between basalt with seawater and basalt with fresh water. And then it changes again to conductive layer and beneath to resistive layer. Now it is highly possible that this layering system continues deeper, but our system is limited to image uh, down to a depth of 500 meter beneath the sea floor. So based on those inversion models, as you, you already uh, showed you, we constructed a new conceptual model of how water are propagating from the land to the offshore environment. And this is our new conceptual model, which we're basically saying the rainfall, saturate the water of the aquifer uh, by percolating downward. And then with the high uh, uh, head uh, levels of water, the water get caught in the confining unit of the low permeability layer. And with the slope of the, of the volcano, it basically they propagates within this confining unit all the way through until they most probably reach the, uh, the submerged uh, part of the island at the shelf edge and then they release to the water as uh, fresh spring, uh, springs. But it could be that there is a lot of uh, structural blockage at the end and therefore the reservoir is maintaining its, its volume. So this is, uh, you can see, Conductive, resistive, conductive, resistive. Those are the two layers that we describe. And this is basically a, a work that is about to be published uh, next week in, uh, in Science Advances. Now, you can say, okay, this is just an electromagnetic imaging, which is remote sensing. Do you have any evidence for that? And actually we do have, there is a borehole that is situated about uh, three kilometers diagonally to our survey line two. And you can see from this salinity profile of this borehole, you can see that it's very uh, 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 um, salty, the high salinity values. And about 350 meters beneath the seafloor, the salinity drops to freshwater kind of salinity values. Now, just to remind you where line two south of in our survey is, I'm showing you back this uh, image. And you can see it's here, just in the south. This is the borehole, the red dot. And it's facing the area 
where we found this large scale freshwater reservoir. So if we zoom in on line two south, look at that uh, um, comparison. We can see that the fresh water, the last large resistive feature also starts roughly about 300 meter, which is in good kind of agreement with the borehole data. So that gives us another layer of confidence that what we're seeing in the offshore, it's basically based on uh, similar features that are uh, that exist in the in the onshore and they're probably linked to each other. Now another uh, interesting observation that we saw just in front of this line while we uh, were taking the data along uh, line two south, I've noticed that at the cliff, at the face of the cliff, there is a lot of lava tube just in front of the survey area. So it could be that those lava tubes are also propagating downward within the subsurface and they basically act as channels of water within that area that, uh, that uh, transport a large volumes of fresh water. And this is possibly why we get this large scale fresh water that is much more uh, robust than uh, in the north, we uh, saturated by a large amount of fresh water. So what I show you until now is everything that we image below the subsurface. And uh, as I mentioned, this is about to be uh, published next week. But another interesting feature that we discovered that was not known before, that we can use this electromagnetic surface tow system to also image uh, freshwater plumes within the water column. It's never been done because there is not there's no uh, place anywhere that those fresher uh, water plumes are so distinct. Uh, and uh, we uh, basically applied it here and we saw some interesting features. So if you look at two, se two sections from uh, small sections from the entire survey, uh, survey, survey area, you can see line 3B and line 3C. And those are their corresponding inversion models. You can see that there is a vertical plume, which is the yellowish, bluish colors that is linked to the deeper submarine uh, resistive layer that we saw in the previous slides. And there is direct link, and this is possibly a freshwater plume that going across from the seafloor all the way up to the surface. We also were able to image all those uh, blue areas in the surface water. That is also fresh water that possibly emerged from from uh, plumes nearby and they drifted into our survey line that is two dimensional and you can see some to some extent laterally. So this is really an interesting feature. And to do some volumetric estimation, we were thinking, okay, so how much if we take a width of, uh, of this kind of uh, freshwater plume, width of one meter, how much water, fresh water do we have over there? So we can take this resistivity plume and convert those values to uh, conductivity and from there to salinity. And this, what you see in the lower figure, this gives us some representation in salinity values of those fresh water along this plume. Then we can know how much plume, uh, there is a volume of water there is in that, uh, in that plume. We can know the average salinity and we uh, discovered that there is about 85% of fresh water plume, fresh water within that plume that's, that's a substantial amount of water that cons con uh, consistently fluxing into the water column while you're taking into consideration the, the regional current regime, that water always moving, but we can still image those fluxes. So that's a really interesting, which means there is always some loss of water into the water column. And just to end, I want to show you uh, just an example of how we actually did the survey by deploying those instruments. So this is the porpoise unit, our receiver. We attach it to the rope, attach it to the rope, and then we send it out. And you can see on the side over there, soon you will see uh, that's the end of the array. That's we're just starting the deployment. And you can see the chase boat over here thanks to Nella, Keith and his guys that were protecting that array. And they extended along with it while we deployed the array and that kept us safe. That was really uh, useful help because there was many times, as you know, your area, 
we had a lot of fishing boats that uh, almost cut our array if we didn't have a uh, Nellas chess boat. So thank you guys for that. Uh, this is pretty much what I have to show. I just want to thank all my collaborators uh, working with me on that, on this research and to acknowledge all the wonderful people that helped me uh, with this study. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I will uh, just... Okay. Anyone have any questions? Werner? It was horrible. Having no. Guess not. All right. Well, I have a question. Um, Henrietta, can you explain for us why um, the oxygen isotopes are, are useful? Like, what's the what's the process there that that makes the oxygen isotopes different in different places? In this case. All right. So what I presented is just the tip of the iceberg of the much bigger project that actually happened within AKY. So there is another team that collected precipitation and measured what the composition of that water was in terms of the isotopes. And so they have constructed curves that show that um, with altitude of where the rain was collected, how these isotopes Right? And there's a linear relationship because what's happening is that as the cloud moves towards the land and it starts leaning out, first it's losing its heavier isotopes and then the cloud ages and what it rains out are lighter and lighter oxygen oh. isotopes in okay. the water. Interesting. So that's pretty much the principle why um, these can be applied. Of course, winds and clouds and rains in Kona are more complex than just simply a cloud moving over from the ocean. And so um, Nicolazzi and her student Diamond Tachera are the ones who are working on that. Uh, they have very cool data now on various storms, even during the eruptions. And so that will shed more light in understanding how really that variation happens mm -hmm. uh, in the precipitation. Great, thank you. Other questions? I have a question for Eric. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the sharks and rays use electromagnetic sensors on their uh, skin to locate prey. Did you control for effects on these animals? Well, electromagnetic waves are very diffus diffusive in nature. So they they propagate in a way that there are, first of all, the water basically eat, eats that signal very quickly. So only what is beneath you uh, can basically uh, be affected. But from every uh, knowledge or every study that has been done, the electromagnetic waves doesn't affect any other uh, species unless they come in a direct contact with it. That, not Thank that you. we know of. The, um, so one of the other sets of sensors that you towed uh, was the multi-beam system? Yeah, the multi-beam is on the side, yeah. And, and what is a multi-beam? I presume uh, multi -beam several is, beams, but uh, is this sonar? Is it different radio? Yeah, it's based on a sonar technology that you have instead of one beam, there is a lot of beams that are projected downward and they give some sort of kind of mapping of the seafloor. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the fluctuation in a resolution of uh, two by two meters. Excellent. Um, so I can think of any other questions. Anyone else? <laughs> I have got a question. Uh, it's, for, it's for Henrietta. Hi, thanks. Um, actually, uh, participating from the mainland. I'm calling in from Colorado this evening. Um, I had a question about your uh, groundwater ages. Um, is my understanding that you collected all those or calculated all those based on C14? That's correct. We actually collected multiple different tracers. We collected CFCs and SF6 as well. 
Um, so those are all chemicals that are more modern and they are better tracers for younger water masses. And so we could use those to... Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm... But carbon-14 was Sorry, the one I'm, that I, yeah, I showed I'm, I'm here. here with some of those other ones. My question revolves around some of those older ages that you were reporting in the range of hundreds to thousands of years. Um, knowing what we know about how rapid infiltration is and, and the high transmissivity values of some of these basalt flows and lava tubes are in this area, um, how, how does that data get reconciled with, with how quickly we know some of that groundwater moves through that area, yet seeing such long, uh, very, very old groundwater ages being discharged at those offshore springs? So, um at least partially we have an understanding of the subsurface in a sense of looking at groundwater level. So we know for sure there must be some kind of confining layers and even vertical structures that act as walls that don't let the water just like recharge and flow straight out into the ocean. And whether those are dike complexes in some regions, we think they are, but there are uh, perhaps other structures that, that are uh, weathered layers and so forth that act as, as these walls. And so, for example, in the Kailua-Kona region, we call uh, the aquifer having a two-structured system, basal, and then the high level, because there is hundreds of feet difference in groundwater level in wells that are in these two different locations. Um, and so we know that there is a structure that holds water back for a significant amount of time. And so these are, for example, barriers to flow that, that hold that water back from, from this fast discharge, as you are saying, how can we explain thousands of years? Uh, perhaps these structures hold back that flow um, and there is this slow percolation from one system to the other. So, so the water being discharged at, at these offshore springs is a combination of some of this older water as well as are you getting responses with those CFCs and SF6 that shows a modern component of that discharger as well? Correct. In fact, there have been some previous studies that calculated the, the fraction of, of uh, the young water, so past 1960s or so. Um, in, in these springs, some of, some of these springs and wells. And then within this project specifically, I only presented on the coastal springs, but there were also um, groundwater collected from well and wells. And, and so those are also analyzed and are being uh, put together into, um, fed into a groundwater model, a hydrological model to try to again, explain the flow paths. And so that's led by Ali Al-Khadi and his student, Brittany Okuhata, and, and Don is also part of that. And oh. So um, yes, that that what is really what causes and where these uh, kind of like holdbacks are happening within the aquifer is, is a big question. And we only have a limited number of wells that we can look. And so that's, that's what's kind of hindering the progress in, in learning more about the aquifer. And so another part of the EKY project is using more of these geophysical techniques that Eric presented on to look at those subsurface structures on land. And so the geophysics team has made some great progress on at least a few areas that they could um, access and do research on. Maybe to, to right. clarify too, yeah, thank the, you both aspects of the, the, the water offshore has not been sampled though. Uh, we don't really know the age of that water, uh, the the water that Eric was was speaking of, so that still remains an open question. Are there plans in the works to to try to sample that? And some of it's kind of deep and a bit of a challenge. And unfortunately, the EK Vive project is is in its sort of final phases of work. Uh, certainly, it's a, a worthy topic to con continue to pursue, but we'll have to find the funding to, to be able to continue this work on into the future. All right, well, let's see. I guess I can't think of any other questions at the moment. Um, any more? Well, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for 
for taking the time this evening to uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the land and the water around us. Thank you for having us. Huh? Thank you very much. Yeah. Happy to share this information with you.